Today, I will present evidence that supports my position. You can choose to either accept or reject this evidence. I'm not asking you to compromise your beliefs. I'm only asking that you have an open mind and listen to what I have to say. Webster's Dictionary gives many definitions of the word theory. But for our purposes, I shall focus on two. The first is what is meant by a formal scientific theory such as gravity, evolution, or relativity. It is as follows. A plausible or scientifically acceptable general principle or body of principles offered to explain phenomena. The less is a slightly less technical, yet more commonly used definition, and it is abstract thought or speculation. What it means to me say I have a theory about where my girlfriend was last night. Now, a good scientific theory should not only explain observed phenomena, but it should also be able to make predictions. For instance, the theory of gravity predicts that if I throw this apple, it'll fall. And if I should throw this apple up in the air, and it should fail to fall without reasonable explanation, we get rid of the theory of gravity. So what sort of predictions can we make based on evolution? One, the more complex organisms should be found in the top layers of sediment, while the older organisms are found on the lower, and the most ancient are found on the deepest layers. We should find transitional species and the appropriate layers in between one species and another at the point where uh, new species emerge, types of species. And um, if we're all related by a common ancestor, there should be unmistakable signs, evidence, clues within our own bodies linking us to all the other animals on the planet. Now, all life on Earth is made up of cells. And at the center of each cell is a set of chromosomes. And on these chromosomes are bits of information called DNA. And these bits of information are organized into genes. And genes basically give your cells information that turn amino acids into proteins. Some of these proteins make your body, but the majority of them are used to create enzymes, which work as a chemical catalyst that makes certain reactions happen. Like the chemical reaction that allows your brain to understand my voice, that's an enzyme, a series of enzymes, millions of enzymes. Now, mutations. <laughs> the mutation of a gene is the first step in the process of evolution. Minor mutations are fairly common. Usually, they have no effect. Rarely, they have harmful effects. But the rarest of all mutations is the one that has a beneficial effect. If a mutation that has a beneficial effect comes about, it will give the, other, the, the organism carrying it um, increased ability to survive, which will make it live longer, which will let it reproduce more, which will let it disseminate more copies of this mutated gene. For instance, the moth. You all learned about this in biology. Before the Industrial Revolution, the trees were white. It didn't get selected by predation. After the Industrial Revolution, the black moth was the one that was well adapted. Here's a nice flow chart that shows how a moth that's predominantly white can move to being predominantly black. Now, we have to talk about geologic time. I'm sorry, guys. This is going to be a little dry. Time on this scale can almost lose meaning. To put things in perspective, consider 65.5 million years. This is approximately when the dinosaurs died out. Assuming an average modern lifespan of 78 years, it would take 839,743 lifetimes to bridge that gap. That's a, uh, you know, ballpark. Now think for a minute, how far back does recorded history go? Anybody? Egypt? 10,000? Close. It's 5,000. I, I, but yeah. Okay, 5,000 years. It's 78 years of lifetime. It's only 65 modern lifetimes put end to end. You know, that gives you an idea of how big the scales we're dealing with are. Now, how do we know about this stuff? It's because of isotopes. 
Isotopes. Every element on the periodic table has two numbers associated with it. First, you have the atomic number, which is the number of protons. And you have the atomic weight, which is the number of protons plus electrons. Now, some elements have isotopes, which are variants on an element with a different number of neutrons. Yes, neutrons. Uh, for instance, potassium-40. Potassium-40 loses one neutron and changes to argon-40. This happens at a predictable rate of one. It happens once every 1.26 billion years is the half-life. That means if you start off with a finite amount at 1.26 billion years, you have half as much. Now, how do we know? Well, it's real convenient because potassium-40 is found in a rock, an igneous rock, that forms underground in granite and little things called mica. And it doesn't have any argon present at the moment of creation. So when you excavate this rock, you can look and see how much of the potassium has turned to argon. Because if there's argon there, then it's obviously because it turned into potassium. It's a closed circuit. Now, at the heart of macroevolution is the idea that all life on the planet shares a common ancestor. At different points in the fossil record, new species diverge from the original line, starting new branches on the tree of life. This is thought to have began 3.8 billion years ago. This is the first appearance of single-celled organisms called prokaryotes. Here's a fossil, for those of you who are into fossils. Two billion years ago, you have eukaryotes. One billion years ago, you have the first multi-celled organisms. This is a very rare find. This is one of the only fossils they've found so far. Then you have arthropods. MYA is millions of years ago. Proto-amphibians. Land plants, insects, proper amphibians, let me go out of the way so you can see, reptiles, mammals, birds, then the dinosaurs died out, making room for birds to take over for a brief period of time. And then mammals rose to prominence. And you have anatomically modern man, 200,000 years ago. This isn't Neanderthal. This isn't Cro-Magnon. This isn't a variant. This is us as we are now, identical, 200,000 years ago. And here's a little example. Now, this is exactly what we anticipated seeing in our prediction. The simpler forms are found in the older layers, moving towards more complex. Now we're going to talk about transitional species. I'm running out of time, so, so I'm going to go fast. We have the tic tac lick, which had a mutated gene, which caused its swim bladder, which regulates buoyancy in modern fish by taking gas out of its bloodstream and putting it into a bladder. That's why fish don't have to swim, they can float. Anyway, it allowed him to breathe air for short periods of time. This is the archipelagic rix, which is basically the intermediate between a uh, dinosaur and a bird. It had warm blood, laid eggs, had feathers. You can actually see the feathers in the fossil. These are very, very popular fossils. Went hard to research them. Then you have the line that leads to modern whales. Starts with the ambuleptus that has semi-reduced back legs. It's warm-blooded. We think it lived a lot like hippopotamuses do now, most of its life in water. Had a four-chambered heart had warm blood, gave live birth, suckled. Then you have this guy, Doradon, which is a much larger, much more reduced hind legs, also warm blooded, which led to this guy, the modern humpback, who if you look, actually has femur and pelvic bones still there. We're going to touch on those in a minute. Those are vestigials. This is domestication, which I don't have time to go into. We know the origin from seed banks and records and fossils of all the main types of foods that we enjoy to eat. Apples didn't originally look like this. They're real small and, and kind of knotty. And then mankind selected them over tens of thousands of years. This is something they did with uh, wheat, modern bread wheat. Originally it had uh, it would drop its seeds and its shake, but we bred it to hold its seeds and shake so it could have a proper threshing. Now we're going to talk about homogulous structures. 
Here you see, I'm sorry guys, I had to use a human arm, don't judge me. Uh, the human arm, the forepaw of a cat, the flipper of a whale, and the wing of a bat. And you see that there are five major bone groups. And the number of bones doesn't change, and the order in which the bones are connected doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the function, size, and shape of the bone. This is called a homogulus structure. And if you look, the whole skeleton's like that. The number of the vertebrae may change between different species, but the basics are all still there. You have your scapula, you have your lumbar vertebrae, you have your pubis. Even with this guy, you have the pelvis, the sacrum, and the same is true with the skull, with the exception of the, the jaw of a reptile is actually has some extra bones which through research and fossils we see moved up and became the bones that allow you, again, to hear my voice, the inner ear. So terrible. Anyway, I'm running out of time. I'm sorry, guys. Then we have vestigial structures. Horses, you may not know this, have bones called the cannon bones that run up the sides of their legs. These are actually vestiges to when they were, you know, more like this guy. These are extremely short. They lived about, I want to say, five million years ago. Anyway, they had toes, and eventually they lost them. And you can still find horses in modern day that have a recessive gene for mutated, the polydactic. You get cats like that too with six toes. You get horses that have extra toes. This is the vagus nerve. This is a nerve that starts off in the brain, and goes all the way down around the thoracic, uh, what is it, the um, aorta, and then back up just to go into the larynx. If you look at primitive fish, this is a straight shot, but because of the way we've evolved, it's, it's stretched down and around as the, the different things. And finally, my favorite, the vertebrate eye, which is by far the most poorly designed most evolution riddled organ, organ I've ever witnessed. This, these are the cells responsible for picking up light. So for light to get to your eye, for you to see, it has to move through the blood vessels, the nerves, and then hits the centers, the, the photoreceptive cells. Better than that, the information is run through a pipeline. Uh, the wires and the blood vessels go through here which means that in your, your, your view, you have a hole, a blind spot, in the middle of your field of vision. All vertebrates have it. This is how we think, based on you know, octopuses and nautilus and other primitive animals, the, the, the vertebrate eye came to be. Um, you know, as time went on, it became more beneficial. People say, what's the use of half an eye? We'll try walking down the road squinting versus walking down the road with your eyes closed, and you'll find that half an eye is very useful. And then, you know, the refractive lens, water-filled chamber, and eventually the modern eye. And I don't know how far over my time I am, but I'd like to end with something that Carl Sagan wrote. This is uh, Earth, as seen by Voyager 1 at a distance of 4 billion miles. And this is called a pale blue dot, and it kind of puts our place in the universe into perspective. Look at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, Every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species live there on a mot of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Thank you.